Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ailet Waldman and Lucy Arnez. Well, hello. Well, y'all can just move on down, can't you? You're way in the back and there's all those empty white seats. I feel like there was a blizzard in this room. Lucy is giving acid to anyone who sits in the first row. That's she right. Says, so, hey, um, look at them all come down. There, there you, you go. There you go. Well, thanks for choosing to come in here. I know there are just a plethora of wonderful things for you all to listen to. And um, you're going to enjoy this. You're going to be really happy that you chose. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming down. That's good. First thing I want to say is this is the book. If you don't have it already, it's in that bookstore right across the way. And you know how sometimes you get a book and you read all the stuff they say about it on the back and you think, oh, yeah. And then you finish reading the book and you go, not exactly. <laughs> Everything that says on the back of this book is what I felt when I finished reading it. It's a combination of research and self-discovery, hilarious, intriguing, thoroughly persuasive, deeply romantic, surprising, all too human, simply delightful. All of those words, absolutely true. I loved it. Thank I you. loved every bit of it. And look, it's so small. You can read it like <laughs> in the bathtub. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of time for reading. It, I really don't. I fall asleep at night if I read at night. So a book, I have to be on a cruise or at the beach or something. And this kept me awake. First thing in the morning, that's what I started doing because I have the same problem. I used to read really? at night for hours. And now, um, well, I mean, because I have the schedule I have because I'm a writer and writers can't seem to do anything before like 10 in the morning. <laughs> I get up with my kids and then I read for an hour and a half. And I just started it last November for reasons you probably won't understand. <laughs> but I, I, I was reading anyway, but what I was reading was making me so tense and angry that I just thought, why don't I just read fiction every morning for an hour and a half instead of, you know, talking points memo. Instead of wishing that it was fiction. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got a lot of questions. All right. Of course, as you know, time goes there's by very quickly here. And I want to save the last 15 minutes for questions from anybody in the audience who has them. So as we go along, think about what we haven't asked you. Um, all right. So just basic background for those of you who have not read the book yet, um, lawyer, mother, just tell us a little bit about who you were who and I why this happened. Okay, so I, I started out my career as a lawyer. I actually went to law school with, um, I was about to say the president, but sort of the last president, with, with President Obama. Um, uh, and I was a federal public defender for a couple of years, and then I began writing, and I wrote murder mysteries and moved on to other kinds of fiction and some nonfiction. Um, what happened was I have a very long and elaborate family history of mental illness. I like to say that the lithium river runs wide and swift <laughs> through the Waldman family estate. Um, but uh, I was diagnosed, I've been diagnosed with all sorts of things in my um, life as a person with, you know, I've, I've been diagnosed with depression for a short period. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. But the diagnosis I had that was the longest and that seemed the most accurate was something called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. The easy way, way to understand that is I was, um, I had bipolar disorder whenever I had my period, hmm. the week before. And it's actually, of all the kinds of mental illness you can have, it's a really easy one once you figure out what it is, it, there is a very straightforward protocol for treating it. They give you a week of antidepressants right before your period, and then you're fine, like really fine. And f everything was great, and I was really fine for, you know, many years. But um, I'm so glad to be in a room where people will understand this. What happens as you inch toward your 40s and your 50s if you're a woman? Uh, you stop being able to predict with any accuracy when you're going to get a period, and then eventually you stop getting a period. And my whole treatment protocol depended on me knowing the exact day that I was going to get my period so that I could take a week of antidepressants before that. And things went off the rails when, you know, in this period they call this, uh, well, period, they call perimenopause. It's about, a, it can be as long as a decade before you become menopausal. You don't know when you're going to get a period. Yeah. And um, sometimes you get it twice in one month. Sometimes you don't get it for two months. Sometimes you get it for two months. It's just this constant, like, <laughs> hormonal soup. And um, things were getting worse and worse for me, and I was trying all sorts of new different and different medications, and none of them were working. And I was getting very panicky. Um, like I said, the many members of my family have serious mental illness, and I'd sort of seen the what can happen at the worst end of the scale, and I was really frightened. 
And um, I had, after um, I was a public defender, I taught law. I was a law professor. And I taught a class called The Legal and Social Implications of the War on Drugs. So I know a lot about drugs and a lot about drug policy. And I had been hearing about this microdosing thing. And I started doing research about um, microdosing, what it was, about LSD, about the neurochemistry of LSD, and um, the relation, you know, sort of what, what hallucinogenic drugs do in your brain, you know, what specific receptors they act on. And it's the same receptors that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors act on, 5-HTP2A. And I thought, you know what? I mean, I'm going to give this thing a try. And I'm like a middle-aged mother of four. I am not, I don't like buy, I'm not, I actually did just buy marijuana when it was legal. It was very exciting. I went and bought um, some mints. You can get all sorts of candy <laughs> now. Uh, but I'm just not a person who does a lot of things that are criminal because the thing, th when you're a criminal defense attorney, <laughs> it makes you really afraid yeah. to be a criminal because you see what can happen, like the worst case scenario is, you know, right there in front of you. Mm. So I was really nervous, but I was also really desperate. So tell, tell me before you get to de really desperate and what you did for it, how did it play out in your life? I mean, give me an example of why you were desperate. What would happen to you? I was suicidal for a while. Like, and I mean actively suicidal. Like, I had been, I had gone through periods of what I call sort of, t you know, typical suicidal ideation where you think to yourself, you know, uh, you know, everything is sucks and I wish I was dead and it's kind of an idle thought. Um, when I was really depressed, you know, in like in my teens or whatever. But I had never really been suicidal and there was a day where I actually went and opened up my medicine cabinet and cataloged the contents and was like, okay, what, what's going to do this job as fast as possible? Mm. Here's a quiz. What is the most dangerous thing in my and your medicine cabinet? Tylenol. What? Tylenol can kill you faster than if anything else. If you take else. enough of it, you, you don't even need that much. That's the thing. I mean, I had of all the things I had, I had one of those Costco jars of Tylenol. You only need a handful and you're dead. So please wow. don't, don't like, you know, you have a headache. Just don't, I mean, don't even take Tylenol. But if you need to, two at a time. That's wow. it. So I was sitting and looking at this big Costco-sized jar of Tylenol, and um, and I have four children, four children. You know, they you can't kill yourself if you're a parent. Yeah. And I, at that moment, I thought, okay, well, I have to do something because I, I, this is not the option. And that's. Um, but then you said you also had days where you had all kinds of energy. Right? Oh yeah, which For is no actually at yeah, all, which is of. almost more dangerous. Like, if you're cycling and your mood is cycling and you have a ton of energy, if you're very, people who are bipolar, people who have what we used to call manic depression, they don't kill themselves when they're depressed. They kill themselves when they stop being depressed and they become manic. Because then suddenly they have the energy to solve their problem, and but their brain still is incapable of realizing what an actual solution to a problem is. So that mm -hmm. the most logical solution to your pain is ending things and you Ooh. suddenly have the capacity to do it. So that was what was really dangerous. And, and I had enough, you know, self-awareness that I recognized, they, I call that a mixed state, it's when you're both depressed and activated, yeah. that this was a dangerous period of time. And I was fighting with my husband so much. And I, you know, I, when I first started talking about this book, I would say this and he eventually told me I have to stop saying this because I would say that he had reached the end of his rope and I didn't know whether he was going to stay with me anymore. And he said, that's just not, that's just my own drama talking that it actually, it might have felt that way to me, but that he wasn't going anywhere. But what he w was feeling and what he says he was feeling was, this is going to be hell and I don't know how long I can take this. Mm -hmm. But like my, I mean, he was feeling the sense of like, my this is, we're all unhappy and we're going to just be unhappy forever. Were which you is terrible. on other drugs at this time? We'd, I tried different things, but eventually I stopped. Um, they were, nothing okay. was making anything better. Right. Um, I often say that if psychi are there any psychiatrists in the room? Or psychopharmacologists? I often say that if psychiatrists said, if you went to a psychiatrist and they said to you, I have this medication, it's going to make, it's designed to make you fat and lose your sex drive. So I'll prescribe it for you. It has this incidental side effect of sometimes making a few people feel a little better. But I mean, because everybody gets fat. Nobody ever wants to have sex. And every once in a while, someone feels a little better. But um, I only had the first two lovely <laughs> effects. 
and not the last. Okay. So yeah. And so that's, that's where I was. Okay. I was in this like so this bottomed is out. Is. And then you heard about James Fad Fadiman's yes. book. Right. You know, when you're a writer, books show up at your house yeah. in the same way if you're a professor yeah. too. Like you don't order them. They just kind of appear. It's literally the best thing about being a writer. You're like, oh, I'd love to read that new Danzy. So yay. Um, so I ha books are showing up in my house all the time. And this book showed up and it was... Um, it was called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. And I was like, oh, please. And I just put it aside because I'm not a psychedelic explorer. And my interest in drug policy was from a criminal justice perspective. I was interested in that. So I wasn't interested in psychedelics. You know, I'm not, I was born in 19, at the very end of 1964. So I missed, I wasn't part of that whole, si I don't know what those of you who are, uh, what were you all doing? Um, so. I, you know, that I didn't drop acid. I remember saying to my husband very authoritatively when we met that if you do drop acid more than eight times, you go crazy. And he's like, do I look crazy? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I picked it up again mm. in this period. And I leafed through it and I saw this chapter on microdosing and all of these remarkable things that people were claiming to have experienced these improvements in mood, this improvement in focus. And I thought, why not? Why not give it a shot? Um, and I, I called Fadiman because I'm, I'm a, a nerd and a researcher. I, I, don't, I, can't, I wasn't just going to take yeah. some random drug. And right. I had a long conversation with him. And he is a lovely, lovely, wonderful man. I don't know whether it's because of all the acid, but he's just the greatest guy in is the he world. An older man? He is. He's yeah. in a, Did he, he live through the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, he, he was one of those researchers. Oh. He was a psychedelic researcher um, in uh, at Stanford. They were doing research on the effects of uh, they brought a bunch of people and they're studying creativity and the relationship of creativity to psychedelics. So they would bring in people who were part of the kind of engineering world at Stanford which was the proto computer era. And many of the things that we, th many of the sort of things, our, our phones, DNA sequencing, a lot of that stuff began in Fadiman's research lab because he would ask these, these scientists, these chemists, um, to bring an intractable problem with them to the lab. And then while they were tripping their balls off, they would work on their problems and they solved them. Yeah, that's and all of these mind, patents that. that's amazing. were fi after, you know, so, um, yeah. you know, the people who sequenced the DNA molecule, all of these things. It's really, uh, it was a remarkable period. Yeah. And Fadiman tells this wonderful story about how the day that LSD was criminalized, he had just dosed eight um, engineers and architects and himself, because they always did that. These were these the psychedelic researchers felt like the research wasn't like they couldn't actually do an effective job supervising the research unless they were tripping too. It's a very deep commitment to scientific method. So he had just taken his. Everyone was taking their acid, and they get this telegram essentially saying, "Ellis, you you've lost your permit for research. This is a Schedule One drug now, or what was Schedule One back then." And uh, he says, I think I got this tomorrow. And he puts it aside. <laughs> now, it's interesting, maybe right here, just to sort of inform people how that actually happened and why, which I never put together, how we went from people experimenting in a good way with what this is in a controlled way and having and you know the good results from it, and then having what happened? Art Link Letters started it. Or, you know, like, and Art then Link Nixon Letters started and the it. War on just a tiny. I think in a way, I mean, there's a lot there, but I think yeah. our art link, link, link letter was actually really, really important. And I think what you saw was a father. It's about, it's about grief yep. and guilt and shame. His, His daughter, daughter committed suicide and he found out that a couple of weeks before she had committed suicide, she had dropped acid. And um, he... He sort of blamed set it off he, like Yeah, it was he crazy. became a proselytizer about how he decided yeah. that the LSD had caused... Uh, the suicide. Now what's interesting is in actual research, LSD is correlated with lower incidences of suicidality, yeah. in fact. Right. So nobody is going to kill themselves because they take LSD unless they're already right. you know, profoundly depressed. So um, he, 
but he went on this campaign and it coincided with the real reason that psychedelics were made criminal was because of the war right. and because of the civil rights movement. So everyone was tuning in, turning on and dropping out like Timothy Leary told. And anybody, anybody here wanna, um, you don't have to raise your hand, but I bet there's some people here who, we're, we're in California, um, there was a lot of acid floating around then. You had to really work hard to avoid it, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, orange sunshine coming down from the sky. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, so Timothy Leary was was went, went on the you know he he took it he took LSD and and Ken Kesey they took it out of the laboratory in the doctor's office and they brought it to the public at large and they thought they were doing this great you know, giving people this great gift, but. That happened that simultaneously all these young people started listening to him and they started leaving their, you know, young white people, leaving their middle class homes and becoming hippies or just dropping acid on the weekend. And then the anti-war movement was in full swing and they started going to anti-war marches. And the civil rights movement, um, Ma um, Martin Luther King spoke out against the war and suddenly there was a confluence of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, at the same time as all of these young white kids were terrifying their parents by not listening to them anymore and not looking like them anymore and not doing the things they wanted them to do. And everybody became terrified and they needed a way to stop this thing. And the way they came up with was the criminalization of uh, the aggressive pr prosecution of the war on drugs although they didn't call it that till later, and specifically the criminalization of psychedelics. So they could you know, charge people, lots and lots of people with lots and lots of crimes. And so a lot of racist uh, connotations to totally, that too, right? Yeah. Totally, So I mean, we've always seen this in the history of the criminalization of various drugs in this yeah. country. They are only and ever about race. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, the first drug that was criminalized was in the state of California, and it was opium, but it wasn't criminalized as a drug only in Chinese opium dens. And what it was, was it was an attack on Chinese immigrants. Because at the time, we did have an opium problem. There were a large number of people addicted to opioids in the country. But the typical opioid addict at the time was a southern white woman because she spent her day knocking back her laudanum. So, we criminalized not the act, not in response to an actual problem, but we criminalized this other area that had to do with Chinese immigrants. Same thing that happened with marijuana. Marijuana was criminalized as a way to attack Mexicans um, and both Mexicans, Im Mexican immigrants and Spanish-speaking Americans with Mexican heritage. There was all the you know the Hearst newspapers would publish these diatribes about how marijuana would make Mexicans sex-crazed rapists. Anybody, anybody ever smoke pot here? <laughs> and not a lot of frenzied sexual activity. Well, it's more like, you know, staring at your hand. Um, and, um, and then the most obvious and ultimately devastating was the way that cocaine was linked, was used as a tool to um, kill and kill individual African Americans and also destroy the African American community. So from the very beginning, there were um, there was again the Hearst papers. Were, they were great uh, tools of this of the war on drugs and were through, throughout their the pe these pe various periods. They would talk about how small uh, cocaine would make black men not susceptible to small caliber bullets, immune to the effects. If you shot a black man on cocaine with a 22, he could kill you anyway. And which is one of the reasons we think that, that sh um, sheriffs and police departments use larger caliber weapons as their standards. Mm. Okay. So, and again and again we see this. I mean, you guys, how many of you are, are lived in Los Angeles area during the worst of the war, the, yeah. you know, the cocaine wars and the crack wars? Yeah. I mean, that, there is, as we all know now, there's no different, C crack is not a separate drug. It's not more, it's just cocaine. But at the time, cocaine was used by white people and crack was used by black people. So we criminalized crack to a hundred times extent than we criminalized cocaine. So again and again, you see that right. in our history. And I think we're seeing that now. I mean, so we're, we were in this period where we were really rethinking mass incarceration and we were rethinking the effects of the war on drugs on communities of color. 
And then the great tragedy happened and uh, everything changed. And suddenly Jeff Sessions is the Attorney General and Jeff Sessions is the most retrograde of Attorney Generals and for 